We are looking here at the oldest religious writings of ancient Egypt. So these ideas that are still current in our society today have origins at least 4,000 years old, perhaps older than that. Although there are no texts, what we have is an experiential three-dimensional model of the afterlife realm. Advanced civilizations that existed before humans, the theory of a prehistoric global civilization. This isn't just your everyday history lesson, it's a journey into a world of ancient enigmas and archaeological puzzles. So picture this, a global advanced civilization that existed way back in prehistoric times, we're talking about a civilization that might have spanned the globe, leaving its mark on various cultures and continents. The idea is that remnants of this lost civilization can be found in the striking similarities among ancient structures and myths from different parts of the world. Now let's zoom in on the evidence that gets everyone talking. Think about those massive stone circles at Stonehenge, the awe-inspiring pyramids of Egypt, and the mysterious temples scattered across South America. Some folks look at these marvels and say, Hey, there's no way these were all coincidences or independent inventions. They argue that the similarities in construction techniques, architectural styles and even the astronomical alignments point to a shared source of knowledge, possibly an advanced culture with technology and understanding that might rival or even surpass what we know today. But hold on, not everyone's on board with this idea. Mainstream scholars, the folks who spend their lives digging through the past, have a different take. They say, Wait a minute, these similarities? That's just convergent cultural evolution. In simpler terms, they believe that different societies facing similar challenges and environments naturally came up with similar solutions. It's like different chefs in different kitchens cooking up similar recipes because they have the same ingredients. But the theories don't stop there. Some go even further, suggesting that maybe, just maybe, this ancient civilization had a little extraterrestrial help. Could it be that ancient aliens gave our ancestors a cosmic nudge, sharing knowledge and technology? It's a theory that's as wild as it is fascinating. And then there's the mythological angle. Across the world, from the legends of Atlantis to the stories of Lemuria and Mu, we find tales of lost civilizations, sunken continents and advanced societies. Could these be more than just stories? Could they be echoes of a forgotten chapter in human history? So what's the truth? Did a global advanced civilization once walk the earth, or is it all just a mix of coincidence, independent innovation, and a sprinkle of human imagination? The debate rages on. All right, let's take a cosmic journey to explore one of the most mind-boggling mysteries out there, the Dogon people and their incredible knowledge of the Sirius star system. Picture this, an ethnic group in Mali, Africa, with astronomical insights that seem way ahead of their time. It's a story that's as intriguing as it is puzzling. Now the Dogon, they're known for their deep understanding of the stars, especially Sirius, which is actually a star system, not just one star. What's wild is that they knew about Sirius B, a companion to Sirius which you can't even see without a telescope. And they even talked about a third star, Sirius C, way before modern astronomers confirmed its existence. This is like having a secret cosmic map in your backyard without any high-tech gadgets. But how did they know all this? Well, this knowledge came to light thanks to French anthropologists Marcel Griol and Germain Dietelen back in the 1930s and 1940s. They spent a lot of time with the Dogon and came back with stories that left everyone scratching their heads. The thing is, some folks think maybe the anthropologists got a bit carried away or misinterpreted the Dogon's symbolic stories as literal astronomical facts. Here's where it gets even more interesting. Some people think the Dogon's knowledge is so out there it must have come from an advanced ancient civilization or maybe even extraterrestrial beings. But most experts lean towards a more down-to-earth explanation, like the Dogon picking up this info through contact with other cultures or astronomers. The Dogon's fascination with Sirius isn't just about stars. It's deeply woven into their culture, their art, their entire worldview. Sirius plays a starring role, pun intended, in their creation myths and big ceremonies like the Sigui Festival which is this grand event that happens every 60 years. And let's not forget the bigger picture. The Dogon are known for their rich culture. We're talking stunning art, complex social structures, and seriously impressive architecture. All of this gives us a fuller picture of how they view the cosmos. Going on a journey through time and myth to explore some of the most captivating and mysterious ancient civilizations ever spoken about, Hyperborea, Mu, and Lemuria. 
These places are more than just legends. They're like whispers from a past that might have been filled with secrets and wonders. First up, Hyperborea. This isn't just your regular ancient land. It's like the ultimate paradise from Greek mythology. Think a place where it's always sunny, no one gets sick, and people live incredibly long, blissful lives. It's said to be so far north, even the north wind can't reach it. And guess who was a big fan? Apollo, the sun god himself. He'd supposedly spend his winters there, away from Greece. The Hyperboreans, they weren't just happy sun lovers, they were described as giants, incredibly advanced, maybe even with some kind of ancient high tech up their sleeves. Now let's talk about Mu and Lemuria. Mu's this legendary lost continent in the Pacific, a bit like Atlantis. Imagine a whole civilization advanced and thriving, and then one day it just sinks into the ocean. And Lemuria. It's said to be this lost land in the Indian Ocean. It was initially a scientific idea to explain why lemurs are found in Madagascar and India, but nowhere in between. Both these places have become symbols of lost knowledge, often depicted as spiritually and technologically superior, maybe even with inhabitants who had special powers or get this connections to aliens. Speaking of aliens, these ancient civilizations are a goldmine for ancient astronaut theories. Some folks believe the knowledge and achievements of places like Hyperborea, Mu and Lemuria came from extraterrestrial visitors. Imagine that, ancient humans rubbing elbows with aliens. Let's set the scene. Gobekli Tepe, located in modern-day Turkey. This place is ancient, and I mean really ancient. We're talking about a site that dates back to around 10,000 BCE. To put that into perspective, it's older than Stonehenge and the Egyptian pyramids. That fact alone is enough to make any history buff do a double-take. But what's truly mind-boggling about Gobekli Tepe are the megalithic structures found there. These aren't just a bunch of old rocks. They are sophisticated constructions with massive stone pillars arranged in circles. Each pillar is intricately carved with animal figures and abstract symbols, showing a level of artistic skill that's way ahead of its time. Now, here's where it gets even more intriguing. The discovery of Gobekli Tepe suggests that our ancestors were not just simple hunter-gatherers at the time. The level of organization and craftsmanship needed to build this place implies that they had social structures, specialized skills, and maybe even some form of spiritual or ritualistic practices far more advanced than what we previously thought possible for that era. And guess what? This site was intentionally buried. Yes, you heard that right. Around 8000 BCE, for reasons still unknown, these people buried the entire complex. This act adds a layer of mystery to Gobekli Tepe. Was it a sacred act? A protective measure? We're still trying to piece that puzzle together. The implications of Gobekli Tepe are huge. It's making us question the timeline of civilization as we know it. It's like finding a hidden chapter of human history, one that could change the narrative of our evolution from primitive wanderers to sophisticated societies. But hold your horses. There's more. Some theorists even speculate that Gobekli Tepe's creation was influenced by extraterrestrial visitors. They argue that the astronomical alignments of the pillars and the advanced knowledge required to build such a site hint at otherworldly inspiration. While mainstream archaeology doesn't support this, it's a theory that stirs the imagination. And now going underwater, diving deep into the mysterious civilization of Dwarka, Picture this, a city so grand and mystical it's been the talk of ancient Indian legends and modern archaeology alike. Let's peel back the layers of this fascinating tale. Dwarka, often called the Atlantis of the East, holds a special place in ancient Indian lore, especially in the epic Mahabharata. The story goes that this city was crafted by the deity Lord Krishna himself, a place of such splendor and magnificence that it seems more like a dream than reality. But the legend takes a dramatic turn. This majestic city is said to have been consumed by the sea, vanishing in a cataclysmic event, leaving behind nothing but whispers of its glory. Fast forward to today and the mystery of Dwarka has taken a fascinating twist. Off the northwestern coast of India, underwater archaeologists have been playing a real-life game of treasure hunt. And guess what? They've stumbled upon something big remnants of what looks like an ancient submerged city. We're talking ruins, artifacts, the whole shebang, all lying quietly under the sea. These findings are like a history detective's dream. They paint a picture of a city that knew what it was doing. Well-planned streets, sturdy structures, maybe even bustling ports. It's like catching a fleeting glimpse of a civilization that we thought existed only in myths and stories. But here's where it gets tricky. 
While these underwater discoveries are mind-blowing, they haven't given us all the answers. Is this really the legendary Dwarka of Krishna? Did this place actually exist as the epic tales describe? Or is it just a mythical city that found its way into ancient texts? We don't have all the pieces of the puzzle yet, but the clues we've unearthed so far are undeniably intriguing. Diving into the mesmerizing legend of Atlantis, a story that has intrigued and baffled us for ages. So let's set sail on this ancient mystery. The tale of Atlantis first makes a splash in Plato's famous dialogues, Timaeus and Critias. Plato, a bigwig in the world of philosophy, spins this yarn about a super-advanced civilization that supposedly existed a whopping 9,000 years before his time. According to him, Atlantis wasn't just any old civilization, it was a powerhouse with cutting-edge technology, a society that would make even modern civilizations look twice. Picture this. Atlantis, a massive island nation decked out with all sorts of tech marvels, a society so organized it would put a Swiss watch to shame and a navy that ruled the waves. But here's the dramatic twist. This mighty island is said to have sunk into the ocean depths in just one catastrophic day and night, like a cosmic magic trick, gone in a flash. Now the burning question, was Atlantis real or was Plato just spinning a good yarn? Some folks think it was all allegory, a made-up story with a moral. But then there are others who are all in on Atlantis being as real as you and me, a civilization that maybe kick-started the legends of advanced societies lost to time. By all accounts, we are looking, if we take what's still under the ground into account, we're looking at the largest megalithic site that's ever been created on Earth. Gobekli Tepe is a site that truly boggles the mind, taking us back over 11,000 years to a time when prehistoric peoples demonstrated remarkable capabilities that challenge our understanding of early human civilization. The sudden appearance, 7,000 years before Stonehenge, of a megalithic site that dwarfs Stonehenge, to me that's a mystery and it's really worth inquiring into. Imagine this. Massive stone pillars, each carved from limestone using nothing more than simple stone tools. It's a task that would require not just considerable skill, but a collective effort from a group of people who had yet to discover the wheel or metal tools. These pillars weren't just any stones, they were shaped into T-forms, a design that's unique to Gobekli Tepe, standing up to 5.5 meters tall and weighing up to 20 tons. One of the many ways that Gobekli Tepe I think is going to prove to be a game changer is it's going to require us to reconsider uh, our whole dating sequence on megalithic sites around the world. The effort to transport and erect these massive stones without modern technology is nothing short of astonishing. Using levers, ropes and wooden sledges, the people of Gobekli Tepe managed to move these enormous stones over considerable distances a testament to their ingenuity and teamwork. This wasn't a small feat, it required a high level of social organization and cooperation, suggesting that this community was far from the nomadic bands of hunter-gatherers we often imagine. But why did archaeologists tell us for so long hunter-gatherers couldn't do it and we needed agricultural well, populations that could generate well, surpluses that could pay for the yes, specialists that was to... The theory. Instead, they were capable of complex planning and communal effort, likely driven by shared beliefs and common goals. The technological innovation and architectural planning evident in Gobekli Tepe's construction are truly ahead of their time. The precision in the carving and erection of the pillars, along with the thoughtful layout of the site, show an advanced understanding of stone masonry and basic engineering principles. This sophistication challenges the simplistic view we often have of prehistoric societies, revealing a people capable of complex thought and remarkable feats of engineering. When you dive into the story of Gobekli Tepe, you're not just exploring ancient ruins. You're stepping into a world where prehistoric peoples pulled off engineering marvels that would be daunting even by today's standards. Picture this, a community back in the 10th millennium BCE without access to metal tools, the wheel or any form of animal labor, decides to build something extraordinary. They set their sights on massive limestone pillars, each one towering over five meters high and weighing around 10 tons and they decide to quarry, shape, transport, and erect these giants using nothing but stone hammers, wooden tools, and sheer human will. It's a scenario that might make a modern engineer blink twice. These ancient builders leveraged ingenious methods, 
likely rolling these colossal stones over logs or dragging them on sleds made from tree trunks, all coordinated by what must have been an incredible communal effort. Just imagine the sight, hundreds of people coming together, each one playing a part in this monumental task. It wasn't just about physical strength, it required a high degree of planning, coordination and social organization, suggesting that these early communities were far more complex than we often give them credit for. And let's talk about the layout of Gobekli Tepe. It wasn't a haphazard arrangement of stones. Gobekli Tepe is a bit more nuanced, you know, we have stone, we have stone circles, we have some interesting astronomical alignments, the world's first perfectly north-south aligned building. These T-shaped pillars were carefully positioned to form circular enclosures, a testament to the builders' advanced planning and knowledge of stonemasonry. They understood the properties of limestone, knew how to quarry large blocks and shape them with precision. The placement of each pillar was intentional, reflecting a deep understanding of geometry and structural engineering. Gobekli Tepe is like a time capsule that's slowly revealing its secrets to us, and among its most captivating mysteries are the potential astronomical alignments hidden within its ancient stone circles. Imagine standing among these massive pillars over 10,000 years ago, looking up at the night sky. Some researchers think that the people who built Gobekli Tepe did more than just admire the stars. They aligned their monumental structures with them. The idea that these ancient builders could align their creations with constellations like Sirius or Orion, or mark the solstices and equinoxes, is mind-blowing. It suggests they were not just master builders, but also early astronomers, tracking the heavens with an accuracy that challenges our assumptions about prehistoric peoples. This possibility opens up all sorts of fascinating questions about how and why they did this. If the alignments at Gobekli Tepe were intentional, it could mean that these ancient builders had their own form of astronomical observation, maybe even a basic calendar system. Gobekli Tepe and the lack of evidence for permanent settlement presents a fascinating glimpse into the spiritual life of people over 11,000 years ago. This site, rather than serving as a home or village, appears to have been a significant ceremonial or pilgrimage destination. The absence of typical domestic remains such as extensive cooking hearths or trash pits that would indicate long-term habitation suggests that Gobekli Tepe was not a place where people lived year-round. Instead, it was likely visited by various groups for specific purposes, possibly related to religious or spiritual practices. This realization points to a level of social complexity and spiritual or religious depth that predates the advent of agriculture and settled life, challenging the conventional sequence of societal development. The stone pillars of Gobekli Tepe, carved with an impressive array of reliefs and symbols, are among the earliest known examples of narrative art, offering profound insights into the prehistoric mind. These carvings feature a diverse menagerie of animals, Foxes, lions, bulls, snakes, wild boars and birds, each meticulously rendered, suggesting a deep reverence or symbolic significance attached to these creatures. The presence of such carvings indicates not only advanced artistic skills and aesthetic sensibilities, but also suggests these animals held particular meanings for the people who created them. They could represent clan totems, spiritual guides, or mythological stories central to the community's beliefs and rituals. Moreover, the humanoid figures, some of which appear to be depicted wearing animal skins, hint at early forms of shamanistic practices, or the veneration of deities or priests donned in ceremonial garb. These figures could represent intermediaries between the physical world and the spiritual realm, playing crucial roles in the rituals and ceremonies conducted at the site. The abstract symbols found alongside the more representational carvings add another layer of complexity to our understanding of Gobekli Tepe's spiritual significance. These symbols could be early attempts at encoding sacred knowledge, marking significant events, or conveying complex concepts related to cosmology, theology, or social order. The carvings on Gobekli Tepe's pillars, therefore, are not merely decorative, but are deeply imbued with meaning serving as a tangible connection to the beliefs, rituals, and cosmologies of prehistoric peoples. They provide a window into a world where spirituality was expressed through the medium of stone and where the natural and supernatural realms were closely intertwined. The story of Gobekli Tepe is like something out of a movie, an ancient site buried under tons of soil and debris around 8000 BCE, only to be rediscovered and shake up everything we thought we knew about the dawn of civilization. 
This wasn't just a case of a lost city getting swallowed up by the sands of time, it was an intentional act, a massive project that likely took as much effort and organization as the construction of the site itself. Why would a society go through such lengths to bury this place? The theories are as fascinating as they are varied, ranging from ritualistic closure to a strategic move for preservation against natural disasters or even invasions. But here's the kicker. Gobekli Tepe turns the Neolithic Revolution's narrative on its head. The common story is that agriculture kick-started the rise of complex societies and monumental architecture. The, the idea that we, that we come across that another turn of the spade reveals information that causes us to reconsider not just was it hunter-gatherers or agriculturalists, but perhaps something bigger than this is involved. Yet here we have an elaborate complex built by hunter-gatherers long before farming took hold. It suggests that the impulse to gather for religious or ceremonial reasons might have been a driving force behind settling down and forming communities. This discovery forces us to rethink not just the timeline of human history, but the very factors that drive societal development. Gobekli Tepe shows us that hunter-gatherer societies were capable of a level of organization, cooperation, and spiritual expression that we usually only attribute to settled farming communities. It hints at a world where shared beliefs and rituals were the glue that held societies together, potentially paving the way for the transition to a sedentary lifestyle. For a long time it was held that the Neanderthals were stupid, primitive subhumans, shambling, lacking symbolism. Turns out that that's not true at all. Certain populations in the world today still have 3 to 5% of Neanderthal uh, DNA. Tucked away in the rugged terrains of the Altai Mountains, where the borders of Russia, China, Mongolia and Kazakhstan meet, lies a fascinating piece of history that has captured the imaginations of archaeologists and historians alike. The Denisova Cave. This is uh, a, a, an issue that I go into in, in America before. And what first drew me into it was uh, Denisova Cave mm -hmm. uh, in Siberia. This isn't just any cave, it's a treasure trove of human evolution nestled in an area known for its breathtaking biodiversity and complex geological history. The mountains themselves are alive with a rich variety of plants and animals, setting the perfect backdrop for a story that's as much about the natural world as it is about our ancient ancestors. I think everybody's heard of the Neanderthals, and these days I think everybody's heard of the Denisovans as well. The story of Denisova Cave began to unfold in the 1970s when Soviet scientists first explored its depths. At that time, their eyes were set on unraveling the geological and paleontological mysteries of the region, largely overlooking the cave's potential to unlock secrets of our past. It's named after Denis, an 18th century hermit who once called the cave home, adding a touch of human history to its ancient walls. With its intricate network of chambers and galleries, the cave hinted at stories of long-term habitation by early humans, waiting just beneath the surface to be discovered. But it wasn't until 2008 that the cave truly stepped into the spotlight, thanks to the discovery of a small finger bone. In Russia, in Denisova Cave, they find a single pinky bone from a little finger. And what they discover is, this isn't a Neanderthal, this isn't an anatomically modern human being, this is another human species. This wasn't just any bone, it belonged to the Denisovans, an ancient group of hominins previously unknown to science. Suddenly the world was paying attention, eager to learn more about these mysterious inhabitants. The cave, with its rich layers of history buried within, revealed that it had been a bustling crossroads for different groups over tens of thousands of years. What's particularly intriguing about the Denisova cave is not just its archaeological wealth, but also its location. Nestled in a remote part of the Altai Mountains, reaching it is no small feat. The harsh climatic conditions add an extra layer of challenge for those daring enough to explore its secrets. Yet it's precisely these obstacles that make the cave so alluring to researchers from across the globe. Every expedition brings us closer to understanding not just the Denisovans, but the broader narrative of human history. Imagine stumbling upon a piece of the puzzle that is human history, hidden away in the depths of Siberia's Denisova cave. The Denisovans are a bit of a mystery, genetically distinct from both modern humans and Neanderthals. Their DNA tells us they branched off from Neanderthals around 400,000 years ago, 
enriching the narrative of the Pleistocene era's human saga. But when it comes to what they looked like, we're mostly in the dark. Our clues? Just a finger bone, a few teeth, and a piece of skull. Though these fragments are robust, they hint at Denisovans being well equipped for surviving the tough Pleistocene Asia. Now here's where it gets really interesting. The Denisovans didn't just keep to themselves, they left a mark on us modern humans. Certain groups today, especially in Asia and Oceania, carry Denisovan DNA. For instance, the indigenous people of Melanesia, including Papua New Guineans, have about 5% of their DNA from Denisovans. This reveals a history of ancient interbreeding that is more complex and common than we ever imagined. Anatomically modern humans interbred with Neanderthals. You can't interbreed with another species. They, they clearly were uh, hum human beings. Denisovans mixed not just with modern humans, but also Neanderthals and possibly another yet unidentified ancient human group. But what about their way of life? The Denisova cave has given us a glimpse, yielding sophisticated tools, a bone needle, and even jewelry. These finds suggest a culture and level of sophistication that challenges our understanding of archaic humans. Third discovery of the Denisovans has been a game changer in evolutionary biology, painting a picture of our past that's far more intricate than previously thought. It's not just about who we are, but who we're connected to, revealing a web of interactions among ancient human species across Eurasia. Yet for all we've learned, the Denisovans remain shrouded in mystery. With each fossil fragment and DNA sequence, scientists are slowly piecing together the jigsaw of our ancient past. The Denisovan genome in particular continues to be a treasure trove of information, promising to unlock even more secrets as research progresses. This story is far from over. It's an ongoing journey of discovery into who we are and where we come from. Siberia's Yakutia region, known for its jaw-dropping temperature extremes, is home to a place as intriguing as its ominous name suggests, the Valley of Death. Tucked away in the northeastern part of Siberia, in the Saka Republic, this valley is not just a testament to nature's extremes, but also a canvas for mysteries that boggle the mind. What sets this valley apart are the curious metallic structures scattered across its landscape. Picture this, dome-like formations and metal objects, some peeking out of the earth as if partially buried treasures all wrapped in a mystery. Are they ancient artifacts, remnants of meteorite impacts, or something else? The truth is, we're still scratching our heads trying to figure it out. Getting to the Valley of Death is an adventure in itself. It's remote, wildly inhospitable, and the weather swings from scorching summers to winters that would give even the hardiest explorer pause. This makes studying those mysterious structures all the more challenging. Local folklore adds layers of intrigue to the valley. The Yakut people have tales that could make your hair stand on end associating the valley and its metallic mysteries with danger and otherworldly energies. According to legend, these structures could wield unknown powers, causing illness or worse to those who dare too close. While these stories add to the valley's mystique, they remain unverified whispers of the past. Scientists, on their part, have theories that could explain the existence of these structures. Some suggest they might be the aftermath of meteorite impacts, pointing to Siberia's history with celestial events like the famous Tunguska explosion. Others speculate they could be the work of ancient humans or a civilization lost to time, leaving behind these puzzling artifacts. But here's the rub. Actually exploring this area is incredibly tough. The extreme climate, the area's seclusion and the sheer lack of infrastructure make sustained research difficult. This scarcity of empirical data means much about the Valley of Death remains a tantalizing mystery. This shroud of mystery isn't just a magnet for scientists. Historians, paranormal enthusiasts, and even adventurous tourists are drawn to its secrets. The allure of uncovering more about Siberia's ancient past and its uncharted territories is irresistible. As technology and exploration methods improve, who knows what secrets will unearth from the Valley of Death until then, it remains one of Siberia's most captivating enigmas. A place where history, legend and science converge in the most mysterious of dances. Let's dive into one of Siberia's most mind-boggling mysteries that the Tunguska event of 1908. Imagine a blast so powerful it flattens 80 million trees, 
over an area of 2,150 square kilometers. That's exactly what happened near the Podkamanaya Tunguska River in central Siberia on June 30, 1908. This wasn't just any old explosion, it was roughly 1,000 times mightier than the Hiroshima atomic bomb. The shock waves from this colossal blast were felt up to 2,000 kilometers away. People at the time reported seeing a bright blue light, almost like a second sun, followed by a series of booms that were strong enough to knock folks off their feet and shatter windows hundreds of kilometers away. Fast forward to 1927 and enter Leonid Kulik, a Russian mineralogist who was the first to scientifically investigate the site. Kulik was expecting to find a meteorite crater, but was met instead with a sea of flattened trees splayed out from a central point like the spokes of a wheel with not a crater in sight. The most accepted theory a small asteroid or comet fragment burst through the atmosphere, exploding 5 to 10 kilometers above ground with the force of 10-15 megatons of TNT. But as with all good mysteries, there are other angles, everything from a natural gas explosion from the Earth's belly to wilder notions like antimatter or even a mini black hole having a run-in with our planet. The aftermath of this explosion wasn't just a big patch of knockdown trees, it had a significant environmental punch, boosting tree growth in the area and reportedly causing genetic mutations in plants and animals, likely thanks to the extreme heat and shockwave it even had a hand in global atmospheric changes, like the creation of night shining clouds and a dip in atmospheric transparency across Europe and Asia. But here's where it gets even juicier. The Tunguska event has been a hotbed for conspiracy theories and wild speculation. From alien spacecraft crashes to top-secret weapon tests, the event's mysterious nature has sparked imaginations worldwide. Despite decades of research and countless theories, the Tunguska event remains one of the 20th century's most tantalizing unsolved mysteries. It's a real-life sci-fi story set in the remote Siberian wilderness that continues to intrigue and puzzle us to this day. This is quite a famous uh, phenomenon of, in, in Turkey, that there are huge cities, they look like ant farms on an enormous scale that are dug out under the earth. Hundreds and hundreds of rooms that huge efforts was put into digging deep beneath the earth and creating these shelters. Nestled in the heart of Turkey's enchanting Cappadocia region lies Derinkuyu, an ancient underground city that stands as a monument to the ingenuity and resilience of bygone civilizations. Its fascinating origins, complex construction and versatile uses offer a glimpse into a community that sought refuge beneath the Earth's surface, crafting a hidden world of remarkable depth and complexity. And archaeology does not have a good explanation about what they're there for, or why they were built, or when they were built. They're all cut out of stone. You can only date objects that were left in them. You can't say when they were actually made. The story of Derinkuyu begins in the 8th, 7th centuries BCE with the Phrygians, an Indo-European people renowned for their architectural skills, laying its foundation. What likely started as a modest subterranean enclave was expanded by successive cultures, each adding layers of depth and function to this architectural marvel. Notably, in the 2nd and 3rd centuries AD, Early Christians seeking sanctuary from Roman persecution carved out additional living quarters, worship spaces and communal areas. They were used by Christians, uh, they were used by Muslims, they were used um, back in uh, 2000 plus years ago as homes in some cases. The construction of Derinkuyu was no small feat. It involved the excavation of approximately 2.5 million cubic meters of volcanic rock known as tuff which is soft enough to carve but hardens when exposed to air, ensuring stability for the city's expansive underground structures. Derinkuyu's purpose extended far beyond a mere hideout. It was a bastion during invasions and conflicts in the strategically significant region of Cappadocia. What makes sense of those underground cities to me is that they were built as places of refuge that people could go into during an episode of meteor bombardment during the Younger Dryas. Beyond serving as a refuge, it also offered a complete underground living environment with water wells, food storage, livestock pens, and even a prison. They're fine. They have air vents, they have water. They're, they're incredibly well thought out. Its intricate layout supported a vibrant community life 
with residential areas, communal kitchens and places of worship, reflecting a society capable of sophisticated urban planning and social organization. The city's capacity to house up to 20,000 people, coupled with its advanced infrastructure, including an extensive ventilation system and a complex water distribution network, speaks volumes about the ancient world's architectural and engineering prowess. I spent hours down there just wandering around and looking at this, this, this amazing place. Of particular note is Derinkuyu's significance to early Christians who found not just a safe haven but a spiritual sanctuary within its depths. The numerous chapels and churches adorned with religious symbols and bas reliefs provided a focal point for community and faith underscoring the city's importance as a religious retreat. Derinkuyu, an underground world equivalent to an 18-story building below the Earth's surface. This ancient city, carved deep into the Earth to a depth of around 200 feet, provided a year-round comfortable living environment. Thanks to its cooler and more stable temperatures, it's fascinating to think about how it was designed to house up to 20,000 people, along with their livestock and possessions, showcasing an incredibly organized society, Adept at managing life's necessities in such a confined yet complex space, with at least 18 levels, Derinkuyu was more than just a series of tunnels. It was a fully functioning underground metropolis. The city was meticulously organized into residential areas, communal spaces, and even sectors for livestock indicating a society that valued structure and community. The intricate layout ensured that despite being underground, movement within the city was fluid. The city's innovative ventilation system is nothing short of remarkable. Thousands of shafts ensured that fresh air reached the deepest levels, a feat that underscores an advanced understanding of environmental control and airflow. This system was crucial for not only providing fresh air, but also for dispersing smoke from cooking and lighting, maintaining air quality for the large population residing within. But perhaps what stands out most about Derinkuyu are its defensive features. Massive stone doors could be rolled across passages to seal off the city, transforming it into a fortress at a moment's notice. The corridors, intentionally narrow, were designed to thwart large groups of invaders, allowing defenders to control movement throughout the city effectively. Moreover, the hidden entrances and exits, some connected to the surface by miles-long tunnels, speak volumes about the strategic planning that went into safeguarding the city. These secret passages allowed for stealthy entrances and exits, crucial for gathering intelligence or making escapes during sieges. Despite the extensive exploration that has peeled back some of its layers, Derinkuyu keeps parts of itself hidden, teasing the imagination with what lies in its uncharted depths. While we've uncovered much, there's still a vast expanse that remains out of reach. Safety concerns and the potential risk of collapse have kept certain sections off limits, sparking a wildfire of speculation and theories about the full scale of this underground labyrinth. Could there be entire levels we've yet to discover, or hidden rooms filled with ancient artifacts waiting to tell their part of Derinkuyu's tale? The lore surrounding Derinkuyu and its sister cities in Cappadocia weaves a rich tapestry of tales that blur the lines between history and legend. Stories of a vast network of tunnels connecting the underground cities suggest a sophisticated system used for trade, communication, or even as escape routes from invaders. The, the two that I visited in the series are, are Derinkuyu and Kaimakli, and these two sites are joined by an eight-kilometer tunnel underground. While some of these tunnels have been confirmed, the full extent of this network fuels the imagination about the capabilities of ancient civilizations, speculation about Derinkuyu's past ventures into the realms of the extraordinary, with some suggesting it might have been a refugee for extraterrestrial visitors or a remnant of a lost advanced civilization. Although such theories stretch beyond the bounds of established archaeological evidence, they underscore the fascination Derinkuyu incites, reflecting the human penchant for mystery and the unexplained. Derinkuyu is a hidden gem that tells a tale of human resilience, architectural mastery, and the intricate history of Anatolia. This ancient underground city, a sanctuary carved from the earth, speaks volumes about the lengths to which people will go to protect their beliefs, their culture, and their way of life. 
Imagine a time between the 1st and 3rd centuries AD when early Christians facing relentless persecution from the Roman Empire sought refuge beneath the Earth's surface. Derinkuyu became their sanctuary, a place where they could practice their faith in secret away from the oppressive gaze of Roman authorities. Within this subterranean haven, they carved out chapels and churches, adorning them with frescoes that depicted scenes from the Bible and Christian iconography, creating a space that was not just about survival, but about preserving their spiritual and cultural identity. But Derinkuyu was not an isolated refuge, it was part of a vast network of underground cities in Cappadocia, connected by miles of tunnels. These connections weren't just for escape or hiding, they represented a sophisticated system for trade, communication and strategic movement, highlighting an advanced level of social organization and urban planning in ancient Cappadocia. This network of cities underlines the region's significance as a cultural and economic hub, showcasing the ingenuity of its people in creating a cohesive and cooperative community. The modern rediscovery of Derinkuyu is as fascinating as its history. In 1963, a local stumbled upon a mysterious room behind a wall in his home, unveiling the entrance to this ancient city. This discovery captured the imagination of historians, archaeologists and the wider public, leading to the exploration of the city and its eventual opening to tourists. Today, Derinkuyu is not just an archaeological site, it's a major tourist attraction that draws people from all over the world eager to explore its ancient passageways, chapels and the incredible engineering behind its construction. Derinkuyu's significance has been recognized on a global scale, as it, along with other sites in the Cappadocia region, has been designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site. This honor speaks to its value to humanity, preserving its history and architecture for future generations. The city stands as a symbol of what humans are capable of achieving when faced with existential threats, creating safe havens of remarkable complexity and beauty. Beyond its historical and architectural value, Derinkuyu serves as an educational resource, offering insights into ancient construction techniques, community living and survival strategies. It continues to inspire and educate, reminding us of the depths of human ingenuity and the enduring spirit of communities that have faced adversity throughout history. Both huge areas of the world that have never been looked at by archaeology at all, or if looked at by archaeology, looked at only minimally. It's really important to understand that archaeology um, is often driven by accidental finds. In the shadow depths beneath the temple of the ancient city of Taposiris Magna, located along the Egyptian coastline, a monumental discovery was made by Kathleen Martinez of the University of Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic, and her team. Let's call in the archaeologists to make sure that we're not going to wreck any ancient archaeology while we're doing this. And that's a lot of archaeological discoveries are made as a result of that. During their meticulous excavations, they unearthed an extensive tunnel plunging 13 meters underground, expertly carved through 1,305 meters of sandstone. This architectural feat, standing two meters tall, has been hailed as a geometric miracle by the Egyptian Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities for its engineering precision and scale. It's, it's interesting that the patterns are geometrical. Someone made it, yeah. and it involved a very large amount of organized labor in order to make it. There had to be the will and the intent in order to do that. The Upalinos Tunnel, extending over 10 to 36 meters, was an unparalleled achievement in ancient engineering mirroring the complexity and ambition of the Taposiris Magna Tunnel, though the latter's function remains a mystery. Despite being partially submerged in water, the tunnel's purpose, beyond its architectural resemblance to historical works, is still under investigation. The driving force behind Martinez's dedication to Taposiris Magna since 2004 has been the quest to locate the final resting place of Cleopatra VII, the last queen of the Ptolemaic dynasty. Are we looking at the traces of a forgotten episode in human history? I think so. I think that's, that's what's going on here. The excavations at Taposiris Magna have not been in vain, revealing artifacts and signs hinting at the presence of Cleopatra and her ancestors. Founded around 280 BCE by Ptolemy II, a direct descendant of one of Alexander the Great's generals, 
Tapo Siris Magna is steeped in the legacy of its founders. The temple, believed to be dedicated to Osiris and his consort Isis, also aligns with Cleopatra's efforts to embody Isis, strengthening her divine legitimacy. This is a very neglected area of the world, uh, as far as deep and ancient archaeology goes. Discoveries within the temple complex have included coins adorned with the likenesses of Cleopatra and Alexander the Great, alongside figurines of Isis, suggesting a vibrant cultic activity centered around these figures. Additionally, Greco-Roman burial shafts unearthed within the site hint at the potential for finding tombs similar to those Cleopatra and her consort Mark Antony might be interred in, raising the possibility of uncovering their final resting places. Looking forward, the exploration is set to extend into the Mediterranean Sea, following the trail of a series of devastating earthquakes between 320 and 1303 CE that led to the partial submersion of the temple complex. Prior excavations have also indicated a network of tunnels connecting Lake Marriott to the Mediterranean, suggesting a broader scope of investigation in the quest to unravel the mysteries of Tapasiris Magna. The tunnel discovery, yielding artifacts such as pottery and a limestone block, adds to the anticipation of what lies ahead. As articulated by Zahi Hawass, the former Minister for Antiquities, the discovery of Cleopatra and Mark Antony's tomb would be a landmark event of the 21st century. Nonetheless, the significance of the findings at Taposiris Magna transcends the search for royal tombs, shedding light on the rich and complex history of this ancient city. The ongoing excavations promise not only the potential revelation of royal tombs, but also a deeper understanding of the cultural and historical landscape of ancient Egypt. Moving on, the mystery of the Osiris shaft, a hidden gem beneath the sands of the Giza Plateau. But he found evidence of, of deliberate burial in a very complicated, difficult cave system, which yeah. you can hardly access. Is this shaft connected with ancient Queen Cleopatra? This ancient marvel is a deep dive into Egyptian engineering brilliance and a profound testament to their religious beliefs, carved straight into the bedrock and plunging about 30 meters, which is nearly 100 feet underground. It's a three-level journey into the past, where architecture meets the afterlife. Right at the doorstep of the Pyramid of Khafre, the entrance to this subterranean complex is anything but ordinary. It's like stepping into a different realm, starting with a modest antechamber that serves as your welcome or warning of the mysteries that lie ahead. This first stop is simple yet precise, a showcase of the ancient Egyptians' mastery over stone, but the adventure only deepens from there. A narrow passage takes you to the second level, a larger space carved with burial niches. Imagine this as a VIP section for the afterlife, likely reserved for those with a direct line to the gods or high standing in society. It's a clear sign that you're moving closer to something sacred. Then comes the final plunge to the heart of the Osiris shaft. Here in the deepest chamber, you're greeted by a scene straight out of mythology. At the center, a massive granite sarcophagus sits partially submerged in water, which seeps in naturally from the limestone. This isn't just an engineering feat, it's a direct nod to Osiris, the god of the afterlife, whose story is intertwined with the Nile itself. The water here isn't just a natural occurrence, it's a symbol of life, death and rebirth, mirroring the Nile's life-giving floods and Osiris' own resurrection story. The genius of the Osiris shaft isn't just in its construction, though carving such a complex directly into the bedrock, managing groundwater and ensuring stability is nothing short of astounding. It's also in how it weaves together functionality and deep religious symbolism. This place wasn't just meant for burying the dead, it was a canvas on which the ancient Egyptians painted their beliefs in the afterlife, a physical journey through the underworld that mirrored the soul's passage to eternity. In the end, the Osiris shaft stands as a profound expression of ancient Egyptian architectural and religious thought, a place where the physical and the spiritual meet, carved deep into the earth. The Osiris shaft presents a fascinating narrative of ancient Egyptian beliefs ingeniously encapsulated in a subterranean complex. This enigmatic site, stretching deep beneath the sands, offers a rare window into the Egyptians' sophisticated burial practices and their reverence for Osiris, the deity of the afterlife and rebirth. 
the discovery of varied sarcophagi within its depths speaks volumes about the social tapestry and the evolving customs over millennia from the Old Kingdom through to the Ptolemaic period. It's intriguing to see how granite and basalt sarcophagi, earmarked for the elite, coexist with simpler wooden ones, suggesting a resting place for a wide spectrum of society. The assortment of burial goods unearthed here, from pottery intended for afterlife sustenance to ushabti figures meant to serve the deceased beyond death, underscores a firm belief in an existence after life. These artifacts weren't just symbolic, they were envisioned to spring to life in the afterlife, attending to the deceased. The presence of jewellery, amulets and various ritual objects further accentuates the shaft's spiritual significance, painting a vivid picture of the personal beliefs and the societal stature of those entombed within its chambers. Less common than in grandiose tombs but equally telling are the inscriptions found within the Osiris shaft. These hieroglyphic texts, drawn from the Book of the Dead, offer prayers and spells to aid the deceased's passage through the underworld, revealing the religious literature that permeated burial rites at the time. The shaft's design and function serve as a profound testament to the myth of Osiris, creating a physical manifestation of the underworld and mirroring the god's mythical entombment in the Nile's waters. This architectural homage to Osiris not only marked the site as a burial ground, but also as a sacred space for pilgrimage and worship, drawing followers to engage in rituals and offerings. The use of water in the deepest chamber, symbolizing purification and rebirth, reflects the Nile's life-giving floods controlled by Osiris, reinforcing the deity's association with agriculture and resurrection. Some theories even suggest that the Osiris shaft's alignment might connect the deceased with celestial bodies, embedding them within the eternal cycle of life, death, and rebirth, a concept that highlights the Egyptians' advanced understanding of cosmology. Exploring the Osiris shaft thus unfolds a rich tapestry of ancient Egyptian life, belief, and architectural prowess. It's a narrative that transcends the mere act of burial, revealing a culture deeply immersed in the mysteries of the afterlife, the divine, and the cosmos. The Osiris shaft stands not just as a monument, but as a bridge between the earthly and the divine, offering invaluable insights into the spiritual and everyday lives of the ancient Egyptians. I am on a journey back through time. Architecture, medicine and writing, the benchmarks of civilization. Many theories have been put forward to try and explain the riddle. None of this happened overnight, so where did all this knowledge come from? You know, when we talk about the discovery of King Tutankhamun's tomb, it's like we're diving into one of the most thrilling chapters of Egypt's past. Picture this, it's 1922 and Howard Carter, this British archaeologist bankrolled by Lord Carnarvon, hits the jackpot in the Valley of the Kings. He finds KV-62, Tutankhamun's tomb, and it's almost like they just left the place. Unlike most royal tombs, which were pretty much empty shelves thanks to centuries of looting, this one was jam-packed. We're talking a gold treasure trove giving us a front row seat to the New Kingdom's burial fanfare. The stuff Carter unearthed is mind-blowing, over 5,000 items. Imagine walking into a room filled with golden chariots, thrones, weapons, and then, bam, you see this golden sarcophagus with the most iconic gold mask ever. That mask, man, it's not just some fancy accessory, it's like looking at the sun, a symbol of the pharaoh's power and divine status. And the tomb wasn't just about bling. It had loads of everyday stuff too, like wood and textiles, giving us a real taste of life during Tutankhamun's time. Now let's zoom in on some of the most mind-blowing stuff in there. First up, there's this solid gold coffin right where King Tut's mummy was chilling. It's not just any old gold box. This thing's decked out with the works that think intricate designs, a traditional headdress, a ceremonial beard, and get this, it's studded with lapis lazuli. That's like the VIP pass in the ancient gem world. It's not just for show, though. These symbols and deities on the coffin are a direct hotline to the Egyptian afterlife beliefs. Then there's the showstopper, the gold mask. This isn't just a mask, it's a statement. Crafted from gold and inlaid with colored glass and precious stones, it's the face of ancient Egypt, literally. It's got this serene look, capturing the essence of what it meant to be a pharaoh. Don't even get me started on the thrones. There's this one throne, a gilded wooden number featuring Tutankhamun and his queen, Ankhesenamun. 
It's like an ancient love seat, but royal style, with detailed carvings and inlays. It's a sneak peek into the royal love life back then. Now, for the warrior in Tut, there are these archery bows and trumpets. They're not just well-preserved antiques, they're symbols of his role as a hunter and warrior. Think about the craftsmanship that went into making these. It's like ancient Egypt's version of high-tech gear. And then there's this lotus chalice made of alabaster. The lotus in their culture was a big deal. It meant creation, rebirth. So this wasn't just a fancy cup, it was a symbol of life's cycle. Of course, there's more chariots, shields, a royal seal, even clothes and jewelry. Each piece is a puzzle piece in understanding what it was like to be King Tut. And the jewelry, oh man, it's not just bling. It's full of religious and protective mojo. So, what's all this worth? Sure, there's a price tag. The gold mask alone is worth over $2 million. But honestly, can you really put a price on a time capsule like this? It's like holding a piece of history in your hands. This tomb, it's more than a burial site. It's a gateway to understanding a civilization that's been intriguing us for millennia. Now, here's the kicker. This find didn't just fill up a museum. It reignited our love affair with ancient Egypt. People went nuts over everything Egyptian a phenomenon we call Egyptomania. And let's give Carter some credit. The guy was a trailblazer in how to do archaeology right detailed careful, making sure nothing got lost in the shuffle. But it wasn't all smooth sailing, keeping these treasures safe and sound has been a bit of a headache. They're old, delicate, and need a lot of TLC. Luckily, you can still see many of these jaw-dropping pieces, including the star of the show, The Gold Mask, at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. It's like a magnet pulling in folks from all over the globe, all eager to peek into a world that's been gone for millennia. Picture this. It's 2009 and Terry Herbert, just your average guy with a metal detector, is roaming around a field in Staffordshire, England. He's got his detector humming and beeping, and then bam, he hits the jackpot. He starts finding bits of gold. Not just any gold, mind you, but pieces that scream history. He knows he's onto something big, so he calls up Duncan Slark from the Portable Antiquities Scheme. And just like that, we're on the verge of one of the most jaw-dropping discoveries in recent times, the Staffordshire Horde. So the experts jump in and they start this mega excavation. They're digging, sifting and recording everything super carefully. Imagine them mapping out every inch of the field, treating each piece they find like a piece of a giant precious puzzle. And the picture they're putting together is nothing short of extraordinary. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. They find over 3,500 items, that's right, 3,500 pieces of Anglo-Saxon gold and silver. It's like they've stumbled into an ancient warrior's dream stash. The stuff they're pulling out of the ground isn't your average old metalwork. We're talking sword pommels, bits of helmets, all kinds of war gear with some serious craftsmanship. This hoard isn't just a random collection of shiny things, it's telling us a story and it sounds a lot like it's straight out of a legend or an epic poem. These pieces might have been trophies from battles, maybe payments to mercenary warriors, or even offerings to some long-forgotten deity. And the fact that they're all broken and torn apart, that just adds to the mystery. It's like they were ripped off weapons and armor as souvenirs from some ancient battlefield. This hoard, dug up in 2009, is not just any old stash of metal. It's predominantly gold and silver, shining a light on the kind of wealth and status these guys were rolling in. But wait, there's more. They also threw in some garnet, glass and other fancy materials for their inlays, adding some serious bling to the mix. Now the sword pommels in this hoard, there's something else. There's a whole bunch of them, and each one is like a unique piece of art. These weren't just lumps of metal on the end of a sword. They were intricately designed, with animal patterns weaving in and out, and even some Christian symbols popping up here and there. It's like a mashup of old world paganism and the new Christian vibes sweeping through at the time. And the way they're made with garnet and glass intricately fitted together, it's a testament to how skilled these Anglo-Saxon metal workers were. But hold on, the cool stuff doesn't stop there. The hordes got fragments of helmets, think cheek guards, crests, decorative plates, and these pieces are as fancy as they come. They remind me of the Sutton Hoo helmet, another epic Anglo-Saxon find. It's like each piece is telling a story of battles and kings. And then there are the crosses. These aren't just religious symbols, they're a clue to how Christianity was weaving its way into Anglo-Saxon England. These crosses were probably used for private devotion. Imagine holding one of these gold and gem-encrusted crosses in your hands, thinking about the big guy upstairs. But wait, there's even more. 
The hoard's got all sorts of odds and ends. Gold strips that might have come from sword hilts, jewelry, bits and pieces that would have been strapped onto armor. Some of these items have inscriptions in Latin or runic script, which is like having a direct line to the thoughts and languages of the time. It's 1947, and a Bedouin shepherd is just minding his own business in the Qumran caves near the Dead Sea. He stumbles upon these old scrolls, and little does he know, he's just hit the archaeological jackpot. These aren't just any scrolls, they're the Dead Sea Scrolls, a treasure trove of ancient wisdom. This accidental find leads to more digging, and before you know it, from 1947 to 1956, they've uncovered hundreds of manuscripts and thousands of fragments in 11 different caves. It's like they've uncovered a hidden library from the distant past. Now let's talk about what's actually on these scrolls. They're mostly written on parchment, some on papyrus, and there's even one on copper. That's some serious variety in ancient writing materials. The texts are primarily in Hebrew, with bits in Aramaic and a dash of Greek. What's really cool is they include fragments of nearly every book of the Hebrew Bible, except Esther, along with some apocryphal stuff and writings about a Jewish sect from the Second Temple period. It's like we've found a time capsule from an era that's crucial to understanding the roots of both Judaism and Christianity. The real kicker here is that these scrolls are the oldest copies of the Hebrew Bible we've ever found, dating from way back in the 3rd century BC to the 1st century AD. They offer a glimpse into the diversity of religious thought during the Second Temple period, like getting a backstage pass to early religious practices and beliefs. For scholars, these scrolls are pure gold. They've been instrumental in studying how the Hebrew Bible was put together and understanding the early history of Judaism, 